almost, isn't it? Uh, in fact, it, it got so hot earlier, I just went out to the garden and I just sat in our paddling pool for about half an hour, just to try and bring my body temperature down. Um, but at the moment we've got, we just got, we're hosting two scouts from um, the US, from North Carolina, and they came over and said, yeah, for us, you know, they've got 40 degrees of heat every day at the moment, and they said, this is like our winter temperature. <laughs> One of them was wearing a hoodie, and was like, what's going on? Anyway, um, so this evening I'm going to be taking Ephesians 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 17 to 23. And if there was one word that I'm going to be talking about, it's discipleship. If there are two words, it'd be spiritual formation. So if you're taking notes, that might help. So, um, discipleship. At the moment, on Wednesday evenings, um, some of you know, will know this already, but we're running an Alpha course. And um, for anyone who's done the course, you'll know that that's a great opportunity to um, ask questions of people who aren't Christians to come and ask questions about God um, and about our place and our purpose in the world. And this evening's passage starts with a prayer from Paul that the Ephesians will receive, as Claire has said now, wisdom and revelation from the Holy Spirit. And it's a bit like that with the Alpha Course, because great though it is as a course, with fantastic material, actually when you run it, you are totally dependent on the Holy Spirit being the one who is doing the speaking into people's lives, no matter how well we set it up. And you want them to then open up and accept Jesus. But like the backpack in the, the top of this picture here, you know, it's only the start of our adventure, isn't it, when we start to know who God is. And here we've got Paul, what's the Ephesians, to not just start on this journey, but to fully embrace God and the Holy Spirit in every way. So I'm going to read the passage from Ephesians 1. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. We had that in our song, the first song, didn't we? In order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who, fulfill, who fills everything in every way. So what is it to be filled to fullness and empowered by God in every way? And this is where the discipleship it comes in. Paul was saying, having the eyes of our heart enlightened gives us a hope of receiving that inheritance as his sons and daughters. The inheritance comes as an ongoing, unlimited, abundant blessing from God. And it's this that empowers us to do his will. And it comes with the promise of eternity with him, like Michael was saying. We receive that blessing through the work of the Holy Spirit. And I know and I trust in God with my whole life. I want to follow him. And this is a proverb which sums it up well for me. I trust in the Lord with all my heart, and I lean not on my own understanding. For all my ways I submit to him, and he makes my path straight. I personalise that one, that's from Proverbs 3. Now, on a minute, before you start saying, you know, what planet are you on, Craig? Um, I, I know it might sound strange standing up here and talking about supernatural blessings and the Holy Spirit and that's not a normal conversation I would have with people outside of church, but I'm hoping that this evening's talk um, will have you know what that looks like in the real world. Firstly, I know who I am and I've got plenty of character flaws that is kind of probably quite happy tell you about. Um, but I also know that I have my strengths. I know that I want to grow and become all that God has intended me to be. 
I want my purpose in life not to resolve around me being, um, but to encompass my love of others. If I was to give a personal character statement, we've had quite a few of these, haven't we, with MPs at the moment, saying a bit about themselves. For me, it would be to say that I want to know Jesus and to become more like him, simple enough. Although, if I was to say that as a prospective Prime Minister, I'm not sure how many votes that would get me to say. Um, but our active engagement in learning how to be like Jesus does not require me to wear sandals, although it helps in this weather. Um, but it is this word, discipleship. And there is though a risk that, you know, thinking about discipleship, it, it can sum that person a picture a bit like this one, when we think about Jesus' and his disciples, which is very alien, isn't it, to, to our lives. Um, literally, a dictionary definition of discipleship is the process of submitting yourself to being trained incrementally in some discipline or way of life. But Christian discipleship is based more on our personal relationship, in which Jesus is calling us into deeper levels of intimacy, trust and commitment. Although it's true to say Jesus did simply say in John 8, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. But to be in this personal relationship, we need to not only understand what Jesus taught, which is to be honest, the best way of doing that is just simply reading our Bible. But holding on to Jesus' teachings is more than just theology, more than just reading and knowing what the Bible says. It's actually a way of life. And the first Christians weren't called Christians at all. They were called followers of the way because they lived out the way of Jesus. And when I was starting to start preparing this talk, um, not only did I come across those dozen Bible verses which are around the room, which um, I'm hoping might Trigger some questions later on, it may not, it doesn't matter. But those were the things that I was reading as I was preparing for this talk. And I was trying to think of some experiences I could talk about where the power of the Holy Spirit, and we talked this passion about the power of the Holy Spirit coming down and how dramatic that might be. But actually, I don't think the passage is about those big events. This passage is more about daily discipleship and that ongoing Holy Spirit power that affects us all through our day, each day. It's a bit like the story where Jesus fed the 5,000, the disciples went out and helped give out the 5,000. And feeding 5,000 people, 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 the big dramatic event, but actually one meal is not sufficient. It's actually the personal daily bread that we need. A more current way, though, to talk about discipleship is to talk about spiritual formation, how we are daily being formed into the likeness of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. And there's a guy called Henry Newell who said this, The spiritual life is a life in which we are set free by the Spirit of God to enjoy life in all its fullness. By the Spirit we can indeed be in the world without being of it. We can move freely without being bound by false attachments. We can speak freely without fear of human rejection. We can live with peace and joy, even when surrounded by conflict and sadness. The spiritual life, therefore, is not a life that offers a few good moments between the many bad ones, but about an abundant life that transforms all moments into windows through which the invisible becomes visible. I got told off for putting a superhero on this by Cass, she said, it's making too much like a school PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> so forgive it, but what I want to say is that um, being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not about becoming superhuman. Okay? We're not becoming superheroes with superpowers. We're not super celebrities. We're not looking for fame and power in this world. When we talk about being receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, it's actually the antipathy of this. In God's upside down kingdom, it's not about our power over others, but it's about empowering the least. It's not about fame, but it's about our humility. We don't do things in public, unless you ask to stand here and talk, um, but we do things quietly behind the scenes. As I'm growing and developing spiritually, I'm thinking about who am I? Who am I becoming? Where am I heading? And how am I going to get myself there? What do I confidently know about myself? 
and what kind of reputation do I want to have? And this is where the power of the Holy Spirit comes into play. It's the Holy Spirit that shapes me. He works on my character. He heightens my conscience. He grows my sensitivity and compassion for others. He brings the fruit of the Spirit as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. In our spiritual formation, we're not trying to reach some kind of spiritual zen where we zone out, where we feel good about ourselves. It's actually far more challenging. I know that I'm unique. I know that I have my flaws. I know that God created me to be me, intentionally, and that he created you to be you, intentionally, and we are different. So as you seek to be formed into the likeness of Jesus, you should also be seeking where has God given you talents, abilities, passions? What goals can you set for yourself? What works well for you? What helps you to grow and shape your spiritual life? Because that's going to be different for each of us. And perhaps what certain spiritual practices can you do that might help you? So going back to, to life on Mars. Um, any ideas, Dave, what that might be? Apparently it's, a, it's an icon of one of the spiritual desert fathers. Yeah. Um, the desert fathers were, and others, were a bunch of Christians in the third century who, I say a bunch, they, they lived in solitude. They went into the Egyptian desert and they decided to live as hermits and just get really close to God in solitude. And um, it's from them that we have all the sort of monastic traditions and, and monasteries that still exist today. Um, and I'm not suggesting that A, we need to go to Mars to find solitude, um, or live in the desert. But one of the things they were talking about was the value of the spiritual discipline of solitude. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I mean by solitude and spiritual disciplines. There is, without doubt, a huge benefit in spending time with God. As a teacher, though, for me, practically achieving this is challenging during term time for all the pressures. It's so full on. Carving out time is really difficult. But in the holidays, it's slightly easy for me to have half an hour sat in the back of the pool just thinking about things. It requires me, though, during term time to carve out time in my mornings normally and before my day kicks off. I have that discipline. In the holidays, though, I can give up more time to actually spend with God, going for longer walks or just sitting reading my Bible or whatever it might be. And it's easier in those times for me to open up more to God. But strangely, the more time I spend with Him, especially in the holidays, actually it brings up more of an inner spiritual fight. I have to struggle with things. God brings things to the surface that He wants me to tackle. But also I know that actually the devil doesn't like me drawing close to God and spending time with Him. There are a multitude of different feelings and emotions that sometimes rise up when I'm giving time to God and I'm not in the business of life. And it can be those times that I'm challenged, that God actually chooses to make me feel slightly uncomfortable because He wants me to deal with something. Um, and it's, it's triggered a, a memory from my childhood because I went to me to the Abbey. Yeah, yeah. So it's a beautiful, quiet retreat on, on, in the North Devon, up on Exmoor. And we went as little children, myself and my sister. And my mum was always phenomenally busy the whole time. And when we went there, going into a spiritual retreat and stepping out of her busy life, she couldn't cope with it. It was just too much to be in God's presence, worshipping, just being quiet and still. And she just literally got up and left and decided that she would walk home, which is about 60 miles away from Centre. <laughs> and they had to send out search parties to try and find her. She, there was four days ago by the phone, she just said, that's it, I can't go, I'm just I'm walking home. They found her and brought her back, fortunately. But it's just like, gosh, you know, actually doing time in solitude with God can be really challenging. So if you do set time aside, don't be surprised if it's hard. But can you develop regular quiet times when you read your Bible? I know I've stood up here before and I've talked about various apps and study guides that can help you. But remember that the goal of reading through the Bible isn't about having to have read the Bible. Actually, reading the Bible empowers us as we're learning to live our lives. Do you set time aside to listen to worship songs when you're at work? How best do you connect with God one-on-one -on -one 
in solitude? Are you aware of the things that contest with your time and try to make that hard? Is there something you can do about it? But it is these times when you tend to be drawing closest to God and the Holy Spirit works in you. You can listen to and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. When he awakens those passions in you and the compassion mm -hmm. for those that are hurting, and you might be called out to pray for them. So impressive though the acts of the desert fathers and mothers were, and their total dedication to spending time with God, they themselves found when they separated themselves from the real world, that's when they started their spiritual struggles. And people came to hear what they were learning and to learn from them. But don't do your spiritual journey, your spiritual formation alone. I think it's really important that you get some support. Now, that might be a mentor. Sometimes getting a mentor is quite hard to get off the ground to find somebody who can spend time with you. It might be finding somebody you can pray with, doing a prayer trip and things. Um, it might be somebody who you're just accountable to. Somebody you say, look, I've got this issue in my life, I want you to, to challenge me about it. Somebody who you can offer you some care and correction. Somebody who can sit with you and pray with you. Don't do faith in isolation. Come and be part of your community together. Meet in a small group if you can. Now one of the great things we have as small group leaders we do once a week is actually having a mix of people in the room all sort of rubbing up against each other sometimes and just like the stones can be polished in this picture actually having different views and opinions and experiences then you polish each other and you learn from each other. You're already doing the next one I got here, church. You know, just having that spiritual formation, time of coming and being together, of worshipping together, of listening to teaching together, it helps you to draw close to God and it gives us a chance to remind us of his great power and goodness. And then lastly, I think all of this that Jesus is talking about is not about just spiritually forming yourself and being, I'm a wonderful person. It's actually about walking that walk with Jesus. It's about doing life with Him. It's about thinking about what's my mission, what's my outreach, who am I going to, where am I going? How am I spiritually growing myself, but how am I doing that for others? If we only see it as forming ourselves for ourselves, we're actually deforming away from Jesus' intention for our lives. We need to find the time to go out to others. And now, I mean, for example, at the moment, Nathan, my Nathan, has got, he's managed to find a chunk of time where he's gone for five months over to Canada to do a disciple training course at YWAM. And that's, that's incredible that he's been able to, to give that time. We can't all do that. Um, it might be that Claire, you did WTC, I know, and you carved out time to give that. But we have different ages and stages in our lives where we can do it. And sometimes you might be able to say, I can carve out now, or well, in the next year, I can do a big chunk of discipleship, learning, investing in God. But no more to do with this passage is like that daily formation of the power of the Holy Spirit. So be realistic. Don't set yourself up to fail. Don't feel guilty if things are too difficult and you can't do it. You see others doing it. Start by taking little steps as you prepare form yourself spiritually. And if it gets tough, which it will, persevere. Now, well, when I gave those random passages out, there was one, which is Philippians 2. Who has Philippians 2 passage? I'm going to ask you if you can. Oh, Marilyn, could you come up and read it? Thank you. So this is where I'm, I'm going to finish the talking bit. But I just wanted to hear this passage. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. 
Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we are going to move on to a time where it's an opportunity to ask prayer.